Uh, right, I'm not going to do a long introduction in the interest of, of time. Uh, Alison's bio is in your uh, programme anyway, but we're delighted to have, uh, again, uh, following last year, a, a Brit who's making a success in America and a top flight publisher. So please uh, give a warm welcome to our opening keynote speaker. Thank you. Well, I was going to say it's great to be back, but uh, this morning I'm remembering why I chose palm trees over the British weather. <laughs> so, so it was, you know, it's my first time at this conference, and I was interested as I went through the program um, yesterday when I had a chance to look at the detailed program more thoroughly, and realizing that actually I'm going to be touching on a number of the themes of the conference, not just the high-level themes, um, but some of the overall topics in the workshops and so on. So I hope that this provides a useful kind of overview and pieces together some of the issues that we're going to be talking about over the next few days. As I was actually preparing for my talk in more detail, I was thinking about the two overarching themes, that of research and publishing integrity and that of a new research life cycle. And I went back and watched Mark's um, presentation from last year and found myself rereading Ken's piece from the Scholarly Kitchen about scientific publishing at a time of political assault. And I would love nothing better than to stand here this morning and to tell you that our worst fears of 12 months ago had not been realized. Unfortunately, I think in many cases that simply isn't what we found. Like many over the last year, I, in the US in particular, I've sought to understand more deeply what it is that's driving the divisions in our society. And since taking over at PLOS, I find myself thinking about that more from a professional perspective as well as a personal one. I've wanted to understand what it is that we might be contributing to those divisions and what we might be able to do to help find common ground. In an era of Brexit on this side of the pond and Trump on the other, this wave of anti-rationalism in some ways seems new, but in actual fact, it's been accelerating for years. It manifests itself in the growing ascendance of emotion over reason in public debate and the blurring of lines between fact, opinion, and lies. And it's particularly profound in the US where the founding principles of liberty and egalitarianism naturally lead to a resistance to intellectual authority. In some ways we've come full circle from pre-enlightenment folk wisdom to an era in which with a little help from the internet we can all be experts on everything. Or as the art critic Robert Hughes described it, we are a polity obsessed with therapies skeptical of authority and prey to superstition. And while in the West we're particularly attuned to this shift, it's by no means limited to the West, as is illustrated by the widespread rejection of evolution in Latin America, where according to recent Pew research data, roughly four in 10 say that humans and other living things have always existed in their present form. So the quotes from the politicians here from each side of the Atlantic are perhaps easy pickings, but they demonstrate the way in which the current rejection of expertise has been led by the top levels of government and dangerously fueled by a rise in populism, particularly on the right. There are some researchers who suggested that there are psychological differences between the left and the right and that these might ex impact our response to new information. Conservatives are more rigid and authoritarian, whereas liberals are more tolerant of ambiguity. Psychologist John Jost of New York University has further argued that conservatives are system justifiers. They engage in motivated reasoning to defend the status quo. Yet this problem is by no means limited to the political right. The case study on the left that best illustrates this is perhaps the denial of um, the values of vaccination. Its most famous proponents are an environmentalist in Robert Kennedy Jr. and numerous Hollywood celebrities. And it's a myth that has spread dangerously thanks in large part to the internet. Close to home for me is liberal, wealthy, and well-educated Marin County, full of San Francisco suburbanites, and it has the lowest rate of vaccination in California. Educated parents are making far worse decisions for their children and everybody else's than those with less schooling. Ironically, this has only been worsened by greater access to information. After a brief look at the internet or Wikipedia, we've all become experts. As Tom Nicholson notes in his recent book, The Death of Expertise, the information age has helped fuel a surge in narcissistic and misguided intellectual egalitarianism that has crippled debates on any number of issues. The acceleration of this trend over recent years has ignited new movements in favor of research and reasoning. 
Most recently, in response to the election of Trump in the US and the attitude of his administration towards science, the March for Science began to take place. Nearly a year ago, it grew to become a global phenomenon with marches in over 600 cities. This one here is my favorite. It's the penguins of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. The concern about the rejection of scientific fact has been accompanied by a concern about a misunderstanding of the scientific method. If, scientific, if scientists are wrong on occasion about one thing, we can't just assume that they're wrong about everything. A great example of this is the way in which doctors' recommendations about eating eggs has changed. Just because that's been revised doesn't mean that we can ignore all guidance about healthy eating and head back to McDonald's. But perhaps one of the most worrying causes of disbelief is the growing lack of trust in scientists themselves. For example, a 2015 poll found that 69% of Americans think that scientists have falsified information about climate change. And a 2014 Eurobarometer poll, an alarming 60% of respondents across the European Union agreed that we can no longer trust scientists to tell the truth about controversial scientific and technological issues because they depend more and more on money from industry. As a community, those of us working across the research to reader ecosystem are passionate about the goals and purpose of science and research and proud of the contribution that we make to rational progress and an informed democracy. But while we can't be held accountable for the latest comment or tweet from Whitehall or the White House, I can't help but wonder if we might be contributing in some way to the decline in public trust. As custodians of the research information supply chain, we pride ourselves on the critical role that we play in reading out, weeding out poor quality and fraud and curating what's most relevant and important to our users. So it seems to me that we should be as troubled by coverage like this as the researchers themselves. There have been far too many headlines about problems in research, ranging across biomedicine, but also into the social and behavioral sciences. Clearly, there are some systematic problems with how research itself is being conducted, but as guardians of the published literature, we have some tough questions to ask ourselves. Most obviously, what happened to the feedback loop of peer review? Why did it fail, and what should we be doing to fix it? And in what ways might we be contributing to the publish or perish culture? It's easy for us to push responsibility for that back to institutions, arguing that culture change has to become, come from within. And while that undoubtedly has to happen, there's a great deal that we can and should be doing to build more human proofing into the system of publication and dissemination through stronger peer review and more transparency in both what and how we publish. So let's use cancer research as an example a field where the impact of unreliability running through the literature has real-world life-and-death consequences. The Reproducibility Project for Cancer Biology was launched in 2013 to reproduce key experiments from some 50 high-impact studies over recent years, but pretty soon the researchers ran into problems. Research groups were unwilling or unable to share important sources like cell lines or pieces of DNA, in some cases, the data and other information was just simply gone or corrupted. In many cases, the grad students or postdocs who did the work had moved on and nobody really knew how the experiments had been done. And lab notebooks were lost or had not recorded sufficient detail. Some studies really are genuinely difficult to replicate because they require real skill to generate meaningful results. But there are issues that can be addressed, if not easily and immediately. Those include a lack of funding for replications and the real problems that we all recognize with the incentive systems in research. But there are also some key issues associated with publication, including insufficient, incomplete, and inaccurate methods sections, lack of information about resources used, and lack of data about other, and other research output availability. So there's obviously a lot of work to be done to reduce the unconscious bias and the sloppiness in research itself. But I'd like to focus briefly here on some of the ways in which the stakeholders represented here in this room can facilitate and encourage that change and suggest some ways in which the published research output and the publication process itself needs to, needs to evolve. It's encouraging to see from the program how much work in these areas is already un underway, and I'm sure we'll hear much more over the next couple of days, but I just want to touch on a few issues from a relatively high level. A key issue that's been widely recognized is that of the incentives in research. 
A 2016 survey of scientists by Vox found that in their view, the biggest challenge facing science was that of perverse incentives. And although the broken incentive and reward system has to be tackled by institutions and funders, we all play a role in sustaining a system in which it is far easier to publish novel, exciting results. And given that groundbreaking findings actually don't happen that often, the temptation for researchers to rush into print, cut corners, and overstate the significance of their work isn't that surprising. And just to note here, my focus here is really on the unconscious biases and sloppiness rather than fraud or true misrepresentation. I think too often those two things get conflated, but in actual fact, they're quite different and require quite different types of action. So one obvious area for us to focus on is to ensure that all of our publications showcase and reward rigorous study design and methods. For many journals, the level of detail can be frustratingly low, even though any true evaluation of the scientific findings really needs to be able to evaluate the data and any underlying information. We also need to be able to recognize the critical lessons to be learned from dead ends. Openness to publishing these can alleviate the publish or perish paradigm and encourage scientists to share their failed results. There are a number of journals that are already doing this, and in addition to being willing to consider replications and negative results, both eLife, PLOS Biology, and Embo Press have introduced policies recently covering scooped research. This is one of scientists' worst fears. You learn that your competitors have done pretty similar experiments than to you, and that they've published the results first. And that fear of being scooped has pernicious and wide-ranging effects, and it weakens the reliability of science. Researchers have a tendency to favor quick and dirty experiments that may lead to many published papers, rather than taking the time for careful methodical work that leads to more rigorous results. So it's important for us to change what's perceived as negative into something that's valuable, and this is especially true for early career scientists. And in spite of the widely recognized weakness of journal impact factor, we've actually had very little success in developing widely accepted complementary metrics. Altmetrics has gone some way to providing this, but there's still a lot of work to be done, and I'm personally interested to see what happens with the relaunch of a couple of initiatives. Plarivate, as you've probably seen, has just launched ISI, and with the wealth of data they have at their fingertips and their intention to focus on metrics, it'll be interesting to see what they develop. And also, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment has just initiated a major push to move beyond the movement of the last few years, which has been focused on getting signatures, to move towards more meaningful implementation of those efforts. And the fact that the UK funding councils have all recently come on board, I think, gives this great momentum. But replication, reward, and reproducibility projects require a sustainable infrastructure to support the increased open sharing of data and other research outputs. Alongside publication of the book or article, we now need to focus on bibliography and data management, the application of metadata, the identification of open research methods and tools, long-term preservation of data, and many others. And we've made a lot of progress over recent years with data. Since PLOS implemented a required data availability statement a few years ago, we've now published over 80,000 data availability statements, and funder requirements are also serving to reinforce data sharing. Librarians also have a key role to play here. They start from a proposition of strength as trusted partners within the institution. But as the range of output grow, outputs grow, it's going to be essential for us to focus on interoperability over the coming years. It's going to be the only way for us to ensure access, usability, mineability, transparency, and discovery of open content. And for some period of time, we're going to have to focus on linking the infrastructures we've created over some 20 years or so at this point, and we'll need to rely on standards to link those common denominators together, whether it's ORCIDs for user identification, counter for metrics, or credit for attribution. Beyond that, our technology capacity is evolving significantly. Driverless cars, artificial intelligence, and natural language processing are all within reach, and in some cases already in our homes. So we need to be sure that we keep pace with how technology can help us identify trends through contextualization, process hundreds of thousands of papers to speed up workflows, and provide predictive analysis. 
New forms of technology such as AI are going to be able to help us speed up indexing, taxonomical classification and contextualization. Greater transparency is also fundamental to research, and that's true of the peer review process as much as any other part of the publication cycle. Peer review remains a fundamental tenant of the scientific communication process, but we can all imagine ways in which it can be improved. Peer review across all types of journal is fallible, not only those that apply a soundness-only approach. There was a study published just last week by Bjorn Brems that showed no evidence of positive relationship between journal rank and article quality or reproducibility. And our current over-reliance on a small number of peer reviewers before publication is putting a real strain on the system. It creates a slowness in correcting the process, and it really doesn't deal well with increasingly interdisciplinary research and big data. There was a recent meeting in DC that was co-organized by ASAP Bio, Wellcome, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And one of the interesting themes that came out of that was the way in which the functions of typical peer-reviewed journals are beginning to break down and take place in different parts of the system at different times. The growing preprint movement is providing new ways to share information and to gain valuable early feedback, while rigorous peer review is still providing more formal validation for publication. And at PLOS, our new partnership with BioArchive adds a further level by providing basic screening for preprints before they're posted on BioArchive. And looking at initiatives and programs like F1000 Research, we see all of those things brought together in a single platform. The main action point that came out of the meeting was actually a push for journals to publish peer review reports alongside the article. Although many of us also favor open identities, there's a recognition that many communities are not yet ready for that, and so the focus is to try and drive open reports as a first step. A small minority of us are already doing this, but I think this is one of those areas that's likely to become a lot more mainstream over recent years. Digital publishing has given us a means to think outside of two dimensions, but still most content is looked at in PDF and printed. But so much of what's debated is far more dynamic than this and continues to move and change after publication. And so we need to think about different ways of presenting science and digesting it beyond video and audio. While much of the progress we've seen is encouraging, we're still hampered by an approach that gives primacy to the paper. There is no hub in research. Knowledge is a network. Research is not by its nature article shaped. So how can we facilitate the same conversation sharing and natural collaboration that already happens in the lab and out in the field? I've touched on this before, but there is a real need for better method sections. And I think our standard should be to record methods in sufficient detail that anyone knowledgeable in the field could replicate the experiments using the published data alone. Sharing other outputs, especially data according to FAIR principles, is also becoming essential. And for those of you not familiar with FAIR, that's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. There was significant progress made at a September 2017 meeting that I, held, that I attended at the Center for Open Science in Virginia. And this was the ne next step with the transparency and openness uh, promotion guidelines, the top guidelines. And the idea here was to really look at the next stage for those guidelines and again, how we can move towards greater implementation of those. There was an agreement that every scientific publication ultimately should incorporate a statement that discloses the availability of all of the research products and materials that underlie its conclusions. It's an approach that's highly achievable, has been demonstrated by journals like PLOS One that have adopted data availability statements. The goal of the statement is simply to provide a structure for reporting that information and then to leave the individual scientific communities to decide how to implement them in their own areas. But in addition to this, there is a significant amount to do in terms of culture change. It's easy for us to sort of throw up our hands, uh, especially those of us who've in, been involved in any kind of significant culture change in our organizations, and realize that this is a really tough proposition. But I really like this framework that was developed by Brian Nozick um, at the Center for Open Science. It combines his understanding of science and as a social psychologist, his understanding of human behavior and motivation. 
So what he does here is he suggests five nested components for achieving culture change. At the base is implementation. There has to be reliable infrastructure, such as data repositories, that makes it possible to do the behaviors we're looking for. This is a step that's usually sufficient for idealists, but not for many more. The next level, supporting implementation, is the interfaces, the workflows that make it easy to carry out these behaviors. And this next step is usually sufficient to bring in supporters of change. The third step is norms, an informal understanding of what are good and appropriate behaviors. And these are often defined and enforced in small world subdisciplines. Typically, this step is sufficient to bring along the substantial middle ground that looks to its community for guidance. The next level is incentives, making the desired behaviors rewarding. This step is usually sufficient to bring along the pragmatists, particularly if the incentives are relatively broad. And then the final step of policy is about making the desired behaviors required. Policy fills in the gap that the individual incentives can't, and it brings along the rest. So in my final minutes, um, I'd like to touch on one of the issues uh, that Mark covered um, in his introduction. And I was very pleased to see that there's a whole workshop to cover this. And that's really thinking about the importance of increasing diversity as a key component of driving culture change. As we all know, publishing and scholarly communication in general have chronic problems with a lack of diversity. Research from The Guardian on publishing shows that while women continue to dominate in the open plan spaces in our offices, the offices around the edges allocated to senior management where the decision-making power lies are still predominantly taken by men. We lament the dearth of talent in leadership, but women still don't have equal, understand, equal standing in the leadership roles in our industry. There's some preliminary outsell research data that shows that only 6% of the top 350 media companies are run by women and just 22% of C-suite jobs are composed of women. But many of these positions are in marketing and HR. And if that isn't bad enough, our track record with other dimensions of diversity is still worse. A survey last year of British publishing found that the industry remains 90% white. Although there have been some significant shifts on the research side, particularly in the humanities and social sciences, we still find very similar patterns across STEM. Increasing diversity can actually create better science. It's not just about who's doing the research, but it's the populations we're interested in that are impacted. There are numerous examples of research that's based on adult Western populations that simply doesn't apply to other cultures and communities. And so while scientists strive to be fair and unbiased in their testing of ideas, the process is still colored by the fact that scientists themselves are human. We can use scientific methods to filter the good ideas from the bad, but the origin of those ideas is still deeply dependent on the human equation. Quite simply, the wider we cast our net, the better science will be for all of us. Beyond the need to move to diversify our own ranks, we have to do a better job in truly globalizing research and inviting the Global South in as net contributors to the world's knowledge production. Our approaches are still almost colonial. On the research side, partners in the Global South are rarely true collaborator collaborators, but simply places where we can outsource tasks in the research process. And this has become an increasing trend over recent years as research grants have typically required some kind of capacity development. But adding a southern researcher at all to collect data really doesn't develop capacity. Sean Harris of INASP has been telling me an example recently that um, she came across. An African researcher told her of a US professor who used to name their research center on bids in order for the US researcher to have a place in country simply to store his equipment. When the African researcher told them after a couple of projects that they didn't simply want to be a storage facility but a true collaborator on the project, the US professor ended the so-called collaboration. As publishers, we need to take ownership of understanding the impact of our actions. One obvious area for this is how we make our content available to the Global South. And there are some great resources from INASP and others that can help us work through that. But our actions also have inadvertent consequences. One powerful example of this is the impact that Jeffrey Beale's list of predatory journals had in the Global South. 
a heavily northern focus automatically labeled journals with editorial boards comprised primarily of editorial members from the global south were labeled predatory. This wound up reinforcing the global north as the center of knowledge production, and it undermined a fledgling publishing industry in the global south, not to mention thousands of researchers' careers. A more positive example of engagement comes through one of PLOS's journals, Neglected Tropical Diseases, although the journal editors really consider this as a journal of the diseases of neglected populations. In addition to the relatively straightforward task of developing content to highlight important health challenges for resource-poor areas, they have an explicit commitment to capacity development. This includes an editorial board that's composed to truly represent the global NTD community. African and Asian scientists each represent about 15% of the editorial board members, with a further 20% coming from Latin America. And to equip and support authors from neglected areas the world greatly impacted by the spectrum of all of these illnesses, we've worked with our EdBoard members and others in the scientific community to provide free manuscript white writing workshops around the world, and to date we've hosted over 40 of those in the Global South. We all have approached the world with a perspective created by our own personal experiences, and those experiences are deeply shaped by our own socioeconomic, gender, cultural, and racial heritage. Being challenged by ideas very different to our own will improve the scientific enterprise and the publishing process. And improving the reliability and availability of research can not only help to build and educate the public, but can also help to build trust in research and public support for funding and investment in science and research. Thank you. So I think if we have any questions, we have three or four minutes before we move on, so I'll pause and see if anybody has. Okay. Hi, Alison. Kent Anderson Kent. from Red yes. Link. Nice talk. Excellent talk. Uh, something occurred to me while you were talking about perverse incentives that we might have created when you talk about the change in, or the unreliability or incompleteness of methods. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about anything you've seen around this. I haven't done any research on this, but it intrigues me, whether the increased discoverability and availability of research might have actually, because of the long history of scientists keeping secret what they can't get credit for, yeah. if all of a sudden when everybody can see my methods, I have to keep a secret again. And whether discoverability and availability have actually maybe perversely incentivized secret keeping. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. Um, I was, I, my sister is actually in cancer research and I was going through um, talking about this with her yesterday. And um, I think there is that, there's that sort of dueling nature for scientists between being collaborative and a desire to drive science forward. At the same time, they are competitive. Um, in terms of methods and uh, other underlying um, tenets of, of the, the sort of the, the research papers, I think it, there probably is some truth in that. Um, there hasn't been a requirement to share. Certainly when you look at some of the projects across social science, there was a similar project in reproducibility, in psychology, and much of it was simply that detail of data was not recorded. It wasn't seen to be relevant. My husband is actually a social psychologist, and he's been working uh, recently um, with a, a longtime colleague of his that's on sabbatical uh, with him right now, and they've been trying to reproduce experiments um, that he had done some 10 or 15 years ago. And they were finding that really key pieces of the research that you wouldn't think were important, such as the time of day in which the study was conducted, actually in behavioral science, can have a significant impact on the outcome. So so I think sometimes there is a desire to hold back the information for those competitive reasons. But I think also there are genuinely times where things that a scientist wouldn't necessarily have considered to be relevant to the results actually turn out to have a meaningful impact. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, we can finish on time. <laughs> 
Ah, one more. Um, that was a great talk, thank you. Um, in, you talked about the transparency uh, around peer review, mm -hmm. in terms of opening up peer review. What about um, increasing transparency of um, the evidence of the effectiveness of the peer review? And you spoke that perhaps the peer review we have um, traditionally uh, wouldn't work for interdisciplinary research. How could you see or encourage or incentivize um, and I'm thinking of, of grant panels as well as peer review in journals, the sort of uh, data that we would need to assess whether peer review is really effective. How, how could the, you encourage the stakeholders, funders and publishers to make that data more open? I think that part of the challenge is actually, again, sort of coming back to Brian's framework, is probably a sort of stepwise framework. And the, the conclusions from the recent meeting were really around, you know, sort of a desire for open, as I said, open identities, as well as um, open review itself. There's a lot of concern about that, I mean, especially from early career researchers about having their reviews open. And so I think the focus for now is going to be to try to bring together the different places in which peer review is happening. And I think the ability initially to be able to capture the review that's happening, say, around preprints, one of the things that we're looking at at PLOS as we sort of launch on BioArchive is thinking about the kind of review that might take place around preprints and how we could facilitate our journal editors having direct access to those reviews when they are considering the peer reviews, the formal peer reviews. So as much as anything, I think it's, you know, we're focusing on trying to think about how we bring together the work that's already happening um, in order to sort of be able, the formal peer review to be able to recognize that and to be able to use that in decisions. I think it's gonna take time for that actually to become something that's more formalized. Um, but I think initially being able to just collect it together and make it available in different ways um, using some of the platforms that are out there. One of the reasons we decided to work with BioArchive rather than sort of doing our own um, preprint platform was really the ability to sort of work where the community was. Um, there are going to be a lot of different experiments, I think, in trying to look at what review of preprints might look like. Um, a lot of people have different ideas about how that can be most effectively carried out, and it's going to be interesting to see which are the ones that actually drive any meaningful interaction with preprints. We all know the struggle that we've had with any kind of post-publication commenting, but I think there's some real hope that preprints are a more valuable space for that to happen, because it really is an opportunity for people to have a direct input into what's something that is still considered unfinished. Great. Well, that was wonderful. Uh, I, could you all join me in thanking Alison for her fantastic presentation? Thank you.